Good afternoon, and thank you everybody for joining us today for what I know is going to be a fascinating discussion. My name is Laurie Regan, and I'm the chair of AZM's Anti-Semitism, Anti-Zionism, and Holocaust Denial Project, which is established to address the various forms of Jew hatred we see increasing today. For those who aren't familiar with AZM, it is an umbrella organization comprised of 33 national Jewish Zionist organizations working across a broad ideological, political, and religious spectrum, linking the American Jewish community together in support of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. AZM is the US Zionist Federation and the World Zionist Organization. I'm fortunate to work with so many wonderful individuals and organizations that recognize the critically important work of addressing and fighting the growing trend of demonizing Jews and Israel and openly denying the existence of the Holocaust. And I want to thank all of the members of our task force for all you do. Um, this coming Wednesday has been designated by the UN as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And we have an amazing program for you today in conjunction with that. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Raphael Medoff, the founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies, based in Washington, DC, which focuses on America's response to Nazism and the Holocaust. He is the author of more than 20 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and American Jewish history, and has contributed to the Encyclopedia Judaica and many other reference volumes. He has also taught Jewish history at Ohio State University, Purchase College at the State University of New York, and elsewhere. Dr. Medoff's latest book is The Jews Should Keep Quiet, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, and the Holocaust, which I have here. The book chronicles the motivations underlying FDR's continued reluctance to help save European Jewry, as well as the complicated relationship between FDR and Rabbi Wise, the leading American Jewish figure of the era. This book is fascinating and informative, and I highly recommend that you all add it to your reading lists. There is so much information that Raphael covers, and while we'll touch on many of the important points this afternoon, we can't cover it all in the limited time that we have. There will be an opportunity to pose questions to Dr. Medoff, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to submit a question, and I'll try to get to as many as I possibly can later on in the program. Today's program is being recorded and will be um, available to view in the, in the coming days. Thank you for joining us, Raphael. I wanted to start by asking you to, to discuss FDR's personal animus towards the Jewish people. Would you characterize him as an anti-Semite and did his personal feelings lead to the abandonment of the Jews or did he have good policy reasons for ignoring the mass extermination of European Jewry uh, for as long as he did? Jews voted for him overwhelmingly. So he either kept any animus he had towards the Jewish people hidden or Jews supported him for other reasons. He had advisors and government officials who also turned a blind eye. Um, and it did anti-Semitism then pervade his administration? When you think about the numbers, the sheer numbers of human beings who were systematically murdered day after day, it's, it's mind boggling that a world leader would sit back and not do anything. So can you share what your research disclosed about FDR in that context? Um, how he viewed Jews and the impact that had on his abandonment of Europe's Jewish community. And I'll just add that um, your description of his views in the context of the liberation of the Jews of North Africa in 1943 was, was very telling. Well, thank you, Laurie. Um, and thanks also to her block, Alicia Post, and everyone else at the AZM for making this program possible. When we speak about a president's private feelings regarding Jews, I think we should begin by considering two separate factors. First of all, how do historians assess evidence about uh, a president's anti-Semitism, potential anti-Semitism? And then secondly, why does it matter? First, let's talk about the evidence regarding President Roosevelt and other presidents. Generally speaking to, um, to answer a question like this, was president so-and-so anti-Semitic, you would like to have the president's own words. Um, and um, that's something which, which historians don't have with regard to most presidents. There are a few notable exceptions, however. Richard Nixon, for example, helpfully tape recorded all of his Oval Office conversations. So eventually we heard Nixon in his own voice making unquestionably anti-Semitic comments about 10 or 12 years ago, we found in um, the, we found somewhat shocking news to many that Harry Truman, 
uh, harbored very harsh views about Jews in private. And we, that, that was discovered in a, a private diary that Truman had kept in, which was discovered at the uh, Truman Presidential Library by accident. And in there in Truman's own handwriting, he had a number of remarks about Jews that were, again, arguably anti-Semitic. Now, President Franklin Roosevelt was notorious for not committing his private thoughts to paper. This is a, a, a trait of Roosevelt's in general. So when we talk about um, possible evidence that FDR was anti-Semitic, we're not speaking of tape recordings, we're not speaking of comments made in public, and we're not speaking of anything that Roosevelt wrote in his own hand. He didn't keep a diary. Many, many officials in his administration did, um, and they're important sources for this specific topic and others. Um, and among them were uh, Vice President Henry Wallace, um, uh, Breckenridge Long, the senior State Department official uh, who dealt with Jewish affairs, and many others, but not FDR. The evidence concerning Roosevelt's private views regarding Jews come from other sources. And historians have to weigh this evidence very carefully because we are speaking about the president of the United States. You don't wanna make a judgment based on, for example, one offhand comment or, or something heard by a third party that might not be reliable um, or sentiments attributed to him by his political enemies. So the evidence that I'm gonna to refer to now all comes from documents um, that were uh, recorded, set down by individuals who were not his political foes, people who had no motive to try to harm the president, and in fact um, were, were recording conversations um, in, for private purposes, not, not in order to publicly embarrass the president. So here we have all together, um, I and other historians have discovered all together about 15 comments by Franklin Roosevelt um, that I think we would all agree would, can be, can be uh, characterized as being anti-Semitic. These are not comments he made when he was a teenager. They're comments made when he was already a, a professional public figure, either when he was running for president, uh, vice president in 1920, or when he ran, ran and became governor in, of New York in 1928, or during his presidency between 1933 and 1945. A number of these comments appear um, in books that about Roosevelt or about uh, Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust, um, which were published long before I came on the scene. They appear in, in such books as David Wyman's famous The Abandonment of the Jews and a number of other works in the field as well as biographies of Roosevelt. But in those earlier works, what you find is one comment by Roosevelt or, or one remark that was attributed to him by somebody in a private conversation, but not, um, but not looked at together as a body of evidence. <clears throat> in one case, we have Vice President Henry Wallace in his private diary, noting a comment FDR made about the need to spread Jews out thin around the country and not allow them to all uh, live in one place in any significant number. Um, or, for example, we have a, um, a, a private conversation he had with a, with a U.S. senator who was an ally of his, in which um, Roosevelt boasted that he knew he didn't have any Jewish blood in his veins. Or, for example, we have a cabinet uh, a meeting, not a transcript of the meeting, but we have Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau's private account of the meeting in which he noted FDR complaining that there were too many Jews among federal employees in the Northwest, that kind of thing. So the sources to which I'm referring are impeccable, members of his cabinet, um, political allies, et cetera. What, what I find significant about these comments um, is that they are all related in the sense that they all reflect a common theme. This is something that I began to notice in my research some years ago when I was reviewing um, a, a series of, of articles that Roosevelt wrote in the 1920s, not having to do with Jews, but having to do with, um, with Asians, with, with, especially with Japanese Americans and the question of Japanese immigration. This interested me because one of the, the dilemmas for people for historians studying Roosevelt's um, 
presidency is the mass internment over of 130,000 Japanese Americans on suspicion that they might become traitors, but without any evidence. Now, as we know, FDR is a man of liberal sensibilities. He presented himself to the public as a progressive and a humanitarian, uh, certainly as someone who cared very deeply about civil liberties. And yet we have this astonishing um, episode if from 1942 until 1945, where without any evidence of, of espionage by Japanese Americans, he ordered the mass incarceration um, of these people, most of them American citizens, <clears throat> resulting in tremendous suffering. Um, and, um, and of course, challenges to the Supreme Court because, because of the civil liberties violations involved, et cetera. So the question for me, what I found puzzling was, um, how could Roosevelt have done such a thing? Now, and it was in the, in the context of, of looking into that issue um, and particularly reading an important book by Professor Greg Robinson called By Order of the President, which explored Roosevelt's, um, his earlier attitudes towards um, Asians, he called them Orientals. And Professor Robinson unearthed a number of articles that Roosevelt wrote for um, a newspaper in Georgia, the Macon Daily Telegraph in the 1920s, when FDR was living in Georgia and um, trying to recover from um, uh, polio. In looking at what Roosevelt wrote about, about Asians, I was struck by how similar that was to things that he said in private about Jews. And that's when I began looking back at the scattered comments about uh, the scattered statements that FDR made about Jews, which appeared in earlier uh, histories of the, of the period and biographies of FDR. And I began delving into it further in my own research because what I saw was a, were, were um, several distinct themes um, that Roosevelt was applying to Asians that he also applied to Jews. And these themes were that, um, that they're a domineering people, that they're untrustworthy, that they cannot be relied upon to fully assimilate and fully become uh, loyal Americans, that there's something in their blood that makes them different. Roosevelt wrote about how one should not mix what he called Oriental blood and Caucasian blood. He said it led to unfortunate results. But this idea that there was something innate in Asians that made them different and potentially dangerous. And I found the same kinds of comments regarding Jews and all of the 15 uh, statements that FDR made in private about Jews to which I've referred, in, in all of those statements, it's, it's, um, it's uh, uh, the, the themes derive from that, that common um, outlook that Jews are, um, are not completely assimilable, assimilable, they're not completely trustworthy they um, they are only looking out for their own interests. If you allow them to congregate in large numbers, um, they will try to take over the economy or the culture. There's a, a comment Roosevelt made in 1941 in which he was boasting in private about how when he was on the board of trustees at Harvard, he helped institute the quota to limit the number of Jewish students being admitted to Harvard. And he said the reason was, if you have too many of the Jews on campus, they will try to dominate the, the culture. These, this pattern of comments that Roosevelt made about Jews um, in private, I concluded, help explain. They don't fully explain, but they help explain, help answer, um, help resolve a mystery that historians have grappled with for many years, but which never really was satisfactorily resolved, which is this. During the Holocaust years, there were a number of ways in which uh, FDR could have helped rescue Jews from the Nazis. This, of course, has been well documented in the work of Professor Wyman and in many other books on the subject by, uh, by Henry Feingold, Monty Penkower, and other scholars. But the, the, the um, most troubling and inexplicable aspect of, the, of, of these lost opportunities is that so many of them involved taking steps that would not have been a political risk to Roosevelt, would not have interfered with the war effort, um, and ultimately could have, been, could have been undertaken with very little effort. And, and to very briefly um, give you an example of what I'm talking about, the immigration quotas in those days, there was a quota 
a maximum number of people who were allowed to immigrate to America from any particular country each year. And those numbers were fixed. The quota for Germany was about 27,000 per year during the period we're talking about. And yet in 11 of FDR's 12 years in office, the quota from Germany was not full. And in the majority of those years, it was um, less than 25% filled. So you had a large number of immigration places that were simply, um, that were never utilized. And at the end of the year, they didn't roll over into the next year, they were simply thrown in the wastebasket. So you have unused quota places. Another well-known example would be the, um, the rejection by the Roosevelt administration of the many requests it received to bomb the railways and bridges leading to Auschwitz or to bomb the gas chambers themselves. This too fits into the, the same kind of dilemma to which I'm referring that um, American planes were bombing the area all around Auschwitz in 1944, including actual uh, the factory areas, the industrial zones of Auschwitz itself. So to have dropped some bombs on the railway tracks leading to the camp would not have diverted from the war effort. So this is the, uh, this is the question which previous um, scholars had not ever really been able to answer. Why? why? Why not drop a few bombs if the planes are already there? Why not allow the quotas to be filled um, if there are all these extra spaces? And a third, a third example, and there are many, third example was, um, would be the question of shipping. When Jewish groups in the 1940s asked the Roosevelt administration to bring over Jewish refugees, even, even temporarily, to allow them to stay in, in the US for the duration of the war, they were told there's no shipping available. And yet we know, and they knew at the time, that, the, that American troop supply ships were bringing troops and war materials to, um, to Europe and then returning empty. And in fact, because they were empty, there was a danger of them capsizing, so they had to be loaded down with rubble, most of it taken from uh, British cities that had been bombed by the Germans. So here you have ships coming back loaded down with chunks of concrete. Why couldn't they have been loaded down with Jewish refugees? Therefore, in looking at these kinds of um, puzzling episodes where it would have been relatively easy or would not have been politically uh, costly to aid the Jews in those ways, why not do it? And that's where I was drawn to the question of Roosevelt's personal views, his attitude towards Jews, and whether or not those attitudes help us understand why he wouldn't take these rather minimal steps to allow Jew, more Jews into the US during that period. Thank you. Um, that you've actually hit on a couple of the other questions that I was gonna um, ask you to, and I probably will ask you to elaborate on. Um, in particular, I mean, I think it, the frustration it seems in, in looking back at the lack of action on FDR's part is as you point out, there were a number of tools that he had in order to save Jews that he chose not to not to use. Um, one of them was the quotas. And in your in your book, you talk about the fact that this quota system was in place. And it's not just that he didn't use the quota that you know allow the people to come in, but it, it's that he actively took measures, I think, to change the requirements of of what it took to enter the country and stay in the country. Um, and so. I mean, we all know about the St. Louis, the, the, the ship came to the, to the US, it was on the shores and it was turned away and sent back. Um, but there are other examples that you touch on in your book also of other ships that came to um, North America, to, to Cuba. And you also touch on the fact that um, there was a proposal, I think there was legislation in order to have Jews be located to, to Alaska. Um, and then there was offers by the U.S. Virgin Islands. Can you just touch a little bit more on that? Because it's such an important point, I think, for people to understand that there were, there, there, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews that could have been saved. Well, the, the voyage of the St. Louis is a very interesting example of what we're speaking about today, because um, I mentioned earlier that in 11 of FDR's 12 years in office, the quota from Germany was not filled. The one year it was filled, however, was 1939, the year that the St. Louis um, brought its passengers across the Atlantic. Now, as we know, the St. Louis first attempted to dock in Cuba because the passengers had documents that they thought would allow them to 
um, to disembark in Havana. It was turned away. And then the ship um, sailed to the Florida coast and waited there for three days in the hope that President Roosevelt would take some action to give them haven. But as I say, because the quota was filled, they could not have been admitted um, through the regular quota system. And frankly, it would have been unrealistic to expect the president to, for example, issue an executive order to, um, to allow them in and override the quota system. Given what we know of the 1930s as a period of extreme anti-Semitism, a period when there was tremendous public opposition to, to immigration, there was tremendous opposition in Congress as well. Given all those um, public and congressional sentiments and the fact that 1940 would be an election year, I don't think it's realistic to think that Roosevelt could have simply um, ordered that they be admitted to the US. But as you noted, um, the governor of the Virgin Islands, a US territory, had just a few months earlier after the Kristallnacht pogrom in November, 1938, he and the legislative assembly of the Virgin Islands had publicly offered to open their doors to Jewish refugees. This is a remarkable aspect of the story, which is not usually included for whatever reason in most accounts of the voyage of the St. Louis. But it's important because it points to a realistic and non-controversial way in which the passengers of the St. Louis could have been saved. Now, this is not Monday morning quarterbacking. This is not um, looking back with the hindsight from 2021 and saying, oh, the Roosevelt should have done X, Y, or Z. The idea of allowing them into the Virgin Islands was raised at the time, while the St. Louis was hovering off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau raised this issue with the Secretary of State Cordell Hull. He said, we have an offer from the Virgin Islands, I'm paraphrasing, why not allow them to land there and stay there temporarily? We have transcripts of these conversations because Morgenthau alone among cabinet members, he actually, he, had, he kept, um, transcripts of all of his conversations. They're a tremendous source of information for historians. They're called the Morgenthau Diaries, but they're actually transcripts, not diaries. They're at the FDR Library in Hyde Park. And we see from the transcripts that Hull came back to Morgenthau. He said, I discussed it with the president and we can't allow these refugees to go to the Virgin Islands. Why? Because in order to enter the Virgin Islands, they would have had to receive tourist visas. A tourist visa was good for up to six months. In order to, to um, be given a tourist visa, the individual had to um, show that they had a, a, an address to which they would return when they were done with their touring. And this is an understandable aspect of any immigration system. The authorities did not want people coming in on tourist visas and then trying to sneak into the country. So you had to clearly have a place you could go back to. But the problem here, of course, was these 930 Jews on the St. Louis, they were fleeing from Nazi Germany, where they had been severely persecuted. It was not a place to which they could return. What Hull was saying to Morgenthau was, well, these people don't have a safe address to which they can return. Therefore, we can't let them into the Virgin Islands, and we're going to have to send them back to that very place. It was the ultimate catch-22. And when the, the St. Louis began sailing back across the Atlantic, everyone assumed it was going back to Nazi Germany. So when the president and the secretary of state made this decision to disqualify the passengers from going to the Virgin Islands on this outrageous technicality, they knew that they were sending them back, they believed they were sending them back to Nazi Germany, to the land where there had just been this nationwide pogrom in which um, you know, thousands of, of Jewish businesses had been smashed and hundreds of synagogues burned down and nearly 100 Jews murdered. That's where they thought they were going back to. Now, as we know, the way the episode ended was somewhat different. Um, during the, the, the period of the voyage, the Joint Distribution Committee negotiated with um, several European governments who each agreed to take in a portion of the passengers. Um, and as a result, some of the passengers ultimately survived the Holocaust. Many um, were murdered in the Holocaust because most of them went to either Holland or France or Belgium, which were overrun by the Germans just a year later. But for the purpose of our discussion here, the salient point is that what you had was a president and a secretary of state who were, it, it seems, kind of going out of their way to find a reason to be cold hearted. 
a way to turn the Jews um, back instead of taking advantage of this offer by the governor of the US Virgin Islands to take them in temporarily until they could go back uh, once Germany was safe again. And no one knew at that point what was gonna happen next. World War II had not yet begun. So would it be a matter of months or years? Nobody knew. Uh, but since the Virgin Islands were willing to take them in, why not let them in? And this ties us back now to the question we were just discussing about the president's personal motives. The conclusion that I ultimately reach in The Jews Should Keep Quiet is that FDR did not want too many Jews in the United States. This is not to say that he approved of the Nazi persecution or the Holocaust, of course not. But at the same time, he did not want to have a significant number of Jewish refugees coming to America because his overall view of American society was one in which, um, which the country should be overwhelmingly white, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. Not too many Asians, not too many Jews, not too many racial and ethnic minorities with whom he was personally uncomfortable. And because he viewed the Jews like Asians as a potentially dangerous element, almost like a fifth column. He didn't want too many of them in the country. And so as a result, every time an, a, an opportunity arose that would have meant admitting some Jews, allowing the quotas to be filled or other steps, his natural instinct was to look for ways not to take advantage of, the, of, the, of those opportunities. So um, that, that's very helpful in understanding um, you know, his, how his personal views impacted his decision to not allow Jews into the country. Um, you also had mentioned the railways and, and the bridges um, that uh, the decision was made not, not to bomb. And, um, you know, I struggled with, I think a lot of people over the years have, you hear people say, I, oh, if there's things he could have done, but I didn't realize until reading your book, Raphael, that the allied forces were actually bombing within you know, miles of Auschwitz, they were there. And so the, the argument um, on the Roosevelt administrations, um, you know, if, they, if they were to take the stand that, well, this is diverting resources that we don't have, but they, they weren't diverting resources, they were actually there. And what I found fascinating was the quote from Elie Wiesel that you included in the book where um, he's actually witnessing the bombing by the allied forces of a nearby oil refinery. And um, he shared that the bombs, quote, filled us with joy and gave us new confidence in life. Um, I guess they were hoping that, that eventually, you know, that, that was get, they're getting closer and closer and they're going to bomb Auschwitz, which they decided not to do. And they could have bombed the gas chambers, but they chose not to. So while, again, we can't get into Roosevelt's head, do, what, is your, what, what, what did you conclude from your research on, on what went into this calculus? During the course of 1944, several uh, dozen requests from Jewish organizations were sent to Roosevelt administration officials urging these kinds of bombings. Most of those requests asked for bombings of specific railways, railway junctions, and bridges. Some of them also suggested the idea of bombing the gas chambers or, or the crematoria. First, let's talk about the question of the railways and the bridges. The idea behind bombing those sites was that um, it was already known that um, hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews were being deported in trains from Hungary to the death camps in Poland. The, in fact, these deportations were reported widely at the time. Under like, uh, unlike earlier phases of the Holocaust, when the Germans were uh, somewhat successful in hiding what they were doing from the wider world, the occupation of Hungary in March 1944 and the subsequent deportations of Hungarian Jews were carried out almost in full view of the world. Jew Jewish refugee uh, rescue activists and refugees in Europe were able to get messages out to Jewish organizations in the US and to allied diplomats, pinpointing the railway junctions and the railway lines, um, which if disabled would interrupt the deportations and therefore interrupt the mass murder process. Now, if Jews at the time had been asking for the allies to, to undertake some special risky mission just to help Jews, then you might say, well, we can understand why the allies had to focus on the war effort and not listen to these uh, requests for special assistance. But the allies were bombing railways throughout Europe at the time. Some years back, 
uh, my colleagues at the David Wyman Institute had the opportunity to interview a uh, former US Senator and presidential nominee, George McGovern, who in 1944 was one of the young pilots um, bombing the, the oil refineries that you just mentioned, the oil refineries uh, that were part of the Aus Auschwitz complex. Um, and in the interview with McGovern, he talked about the fact that they were constantly bombing railways and constantly bombing bridges. Now, railways um, were easier to repair than bridges. Sometimes the Germans could repair them in a day or a few days, but that didn't stop the allies from constantly hitting them because they were an important part of the war effort. Bridges took even longer to repair, as you can imagine. So a few well-placed well strikes hitting those key bridges. Again, the names of those bridges were cited in many of the requests that Jewish groups were submitting to the Roosevelt administration. Hitting those bridges could have made a substantial difference. It's not that such bombings would have um, ended the Holocaust or prevented the Holocaust. Obviously not. We're talking about trying to interrupt the mass murder to save some people. Now, Auschwitz at its peak in 1944 um, was the site of the gassing of, of some 12,000 Jews every single day. So a disruption of the deportations, even for a short time, could have made a significant difference. The, um, the War Department, as it was known then, today it's the Defense Department, but the War Department replied to these Jewish requests with something that was looked like, uh, it was almost a form letter because it was the same language each time. And, and the Assistant Secretary of War replied that because um, that, be, that, that that bombing these targets um, would require diversion from the uh, of airplanes that were engaged in the war effort elsewhere in Europe. He claimed that a study had been done um, that showed that that's what it would have necessitated. And in fact, there was no such study. Historians have scoured the relevant archives for decades and never found such a study. There was no study. Um, that was an excuse concocted to explain away what was essentially a mindset in the Roosevelt administration. The mindset was not to take even the most minimal steps um, outside the war effort to help uh, Jewish civilians, Jewish refugees. These requests for bombing did not reach the White House as far as we know. They were handled um, by the Secretary of War and also by the Secretary of State, but mostly through the War Department. However, the State Department and the War Department did not make their own policies. They implement the policies of the White House. That was true then, it's true now. Um, so the Secretary of State and the Secretary of War um, and the senior staff, they understood the overall policy of the administration, um, not to take even minimal steps for humanitarian purposes. So in rejecting these bombing requests, um, they uh, correctly were, uh, uh, you know, assumed that they were reflecting what was essentially you know, the mindset or the, the overall will of President Roosevelt and the White House. The question of bombing the gas chambers or the crematoria themselves um, is a little more complicated, um, but, um, but something that was unquestionably feasible from a military point of view. Now, you mentioned Elie Wiesel. So Elie Wiesel at the time was a 16 year old slave laborer in the industrial zone of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a huge sprawling complex and in addition to the mass murder area known as Birkenau, um, there were factories that were manufacturing synthetic oil for the German war effort. And because they were, that's what they were producing, they were considered legitimate military targets. So in the summer and fall of 1944, um, the um, American planes bombed those oil factories just a few miles from the gas chambers um, repeatedly. And Elie Wiesel was among those who witnessed it, witnessed those bombings, and he does write about it in his famous book, Night. A, a, a precision bombing, as they called, a pinpoint strike on a small target was difficult, but the Allies still carried out such bombings on many occasions. Uh, there's a famous um, precision bombing of a, of a prison in, in, Fr in German-occupied France, where they're able to just hit the walls of the prison, enabling many Allied prisoners of war to escape. Um, even maybe even more directly, there's an allied bombing um, of Buchenwald, of the Buchenwald concentration camp, because it was a part of the camp, which was a slave labor area manufacturing um, rockets for the, for the German war effort. And the, uh, the Americans uh, carried out a, a bombing of Buchenwald in which they hit 
the industrial area, but managed to avoid hitting the barracks right adjacent to it. The same thing presumably would have, would have been the case with a bombing of Auschwitz, that the planes would have targeted the gas chambers and the crematoria <coughs> while trying to avoid the civilians. The question of avoiding civilians, though, is something that we wonder about in retrospect, but that's not what was raised at the time as an objection. The War Department didn't say, well, we can't bomb this death camp because then we might accidentally hit the civilians, um, the prisoners. It would have been a ridiculous excuse because the whole point of bombing it was because all of these prisoners were being murdered by the thousands daily. So they never claimed that. Instead, they used this concocted excuse saying that um, it would have required the diversion of planes, which we know it would not have. The numbers are staggering and it's just shocking. Um, I, I wanna turn now to what was going on in the American Jewish community. Um, your book is called The Jews Should Keep Quiet, which is I believe what FDR um, actually said. But what was Jewish leadership doing? Um, was FDR intentionally stifling Jewish critics of his policies? Was there a failure on the part of Jewish leadership to grasp what was transpiring? Was there a fear on the part of Jewish leadership to speak out? Or is it you know, more complicated than that? I'd also like you to touch on whether the Jewish community was united in pushing for US action to intervene, and if not, um, would it have made a difference if they had been? I, and I ask that also in the context of Jews today who are very divided on issues from the JCPOA to a two-state solution. I'm wondering, you know, within the Jewish community, was, was there a division on how to handle um, what was happening in Europe? And um, I'll also ask you, if you can, to touch on the fact that um, you had mentioned that Jews were not fully accepted in America at the time. I believe I saw that in your book. And I'm wondering how that might have impacted their reaction to what they were learning about the events leading up to the Holocaust. The title of the book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is a close paraphrase of something that President Roosevelt said on a number of occasions to the most prominent American Jewish leader of that era, Rabbi Stephen Wise. Wise um, had a relationship with the president which enabled him to occasionally um, get a meeting at the White House. And um, on a number of those occasions, Roosevelt was um, troubled by the prospect that American Jews might criticize his policies towards uh, European Jewish refugees. And so he leaned on wise through flattery, through pressure, through insinuation. He would lean on wise to not only refrain from criticizing US policies, but also to turn around and try to keep the rest of the Jewish community quiet, so to speak. Now, there were many Jews um, in that era who did not need to be told by Rabbi Wise to keep quiet, which is to say um, that given the atmosphere of, ex of extreme anti-Semitism, isolationism before the war, um, nativism, um, there were many American Jews who were um, intimidated by that atmosphere and who were uncomfortable with the idea of speaking out publicly on Jewish issues. Today, we're accustomed, for example, to Jewish groups um, taking out full page ads in the New York Times. But this was something that was unheard of in the 1930s. It was a generation that consisted to a large extent of immigrants or children of immigrants. And, they, and, and broadly speaking, they were keenly aware that they were not fully accepted um, in all aspects of American society. And many were nervous that if they spoke out and pushed Jewish concerns in the public arena, that it might affect their own status and it might, for example, uh, inspire more anti-Semitism. So this was a, a very real fear. Um, at the same time, um, leaders like Rabbi Wise and other leaders of the major Jewish and Zionist organizations at that time, um, in my view, had a responsibility to, to weigh those fears and to try to um, assess how realistic they were. In other words, the leader of a, of a, of a, a large Jewish organization had a responsibility to, to decide how far he could go um, in raising or pressing Jewish concerns. His job, um, and I'm saying his because there were very few women in leadership positions in American Jewish organizations in those days. Um, his job was to represent Jewish concerns to powers in Washington, to the public and so forth. So that was his responsibility. 
The question was how far to push it. Um, in the documents, we have um, instances in which um, Rabbi Wise or other Jewish leaders um, specifically um, articulate decisions to refrain from publicly protesting, protesting because of a fear that there might be um, anti-Semitism or that the president might be angry um, or that there might be some other kind of backlash. And to, to cite one interesting specific example, um, in the autumn of 1943, in a real break with the way Jewish politics were conducted, um, Jewish activists organized more than 400 Orthodox rabbis to march through Washington to the White House to plead for the rescue of Europe's Jews. They were warned, the, the protesters, the, the leaders of, of, this, of this rabbinical march were warned in advance um, by some Jewish leaders that they should not do it because it might result in pogroms. That was the kind of language that was used in trying to stop them. Well, they marched anyway. Um, uh, they marched to the Capitol. They then continued to the White House. The president refused to see them. Um, it, it's, a, it's an important and alarming story, but the point I wanna make about it here is there were no pogroms as a result. So it seems to me, and I discuss this at greater length in the book, it seems to me that at, at that point, a leader like Rabbi Wise really needed to take a sober look um, at, at, at the situation. The fears of, of a march to the White House by Jews in long black coats and black hats and long white beards. That had not provoked a pogrom. So perhaps they should have been able to see at that point that this strategy of keeping quiet was really based on exaggerated fears, not on realistic fears. I, I um, highly recommend that anybody that wants to learn more about the role of Jewish leadership and Rabbi Wise in particular, um, throughout that the, maybe the decade leading up to the actual Holocaust, the final solution impl implementation should definitely read the book because it's, um, it's fascinating, it, it truly is. Um, I, before I take, there's a lot of questions and I wanna get to them, but I just wanna ask you one final question, Raphael. Uh, do you see any parallels between the events that led up to the Holocaust and what we see with growing anti-Semitism today? Hitler's ideology was first spread on college campuses with youth groups, and we've got you know uh, youth groups now on our college campuses promoting BDS and intimidating and ostracizing um, student Zionists. Um, we have our synagogues that are being attacked. The, the, the good news is that we are not silent, and I'm not suggesting that another Holocaust is is imminent. But I'm wondering if there's any lessons that you've drawn that you can impart on how anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism as manifested today should be addressed by both the Jewish community and even the federal government and perhaps touch on how pervasive anti-Semitism was in America at the time of the Holocaust and, role, and what role that might have played in the Jews remaining silent for fear of reprisal as you've already touched on. Historians describe the 1930s uh, and the early 1940s as a, the period of the most anti-Semitism in American history. There were more than 100 anti-Semitic organizations uh, active around the country. And there were a number of very notorious public figures who had a substantial following like Father, Father Charles Coughlin, um, who were inciting a hatred of Jews. There was also um, periodic street violence as has been amply documented by Professor Stephen Norwood at Oklahoma um, there were uh, uh, gangs of uh, largely Irish American Catholic um, thugs who assaulted young Jews, especially Jewish youngsters, uh, in New York City and Boston in the late 30s and 1940s to agree um, that is shocking even by today's standards. There are, I think, however, um, significant differences between the anti Semitism of today and the anti Semitism of those days. Um, I think the most important is what I will call the politicization of anti-Semitism in our own time, which is to say, in the 1930s, there was no disagreement as to what was anti-Semitic, as to who was anti-Semitic, or the definition of what anti-Semitism was. There was no debate over whether Char Father Coughlin was really anti-Semitic or just anti-communist. There was a consensus in the Jewish community recognizing um, the anti-Semitism that was prevalent in those days, and it came almost exclusively from the far right. 
today, um, what we see is that frequently um, perceptions of anti-Semitism fall along political lines in which people at one end of the spectrum um, have difficulty acknowledging when there's anti-Semitism um, that is loosely, you know, roughly speaking, is coming from their camp. People at the other end um, are, are, are slow to recognize it when it seems to be coming from their side of the political aisle. It, it's even to the point where there are, as you know, um, vigorous debates as to what even constitutes anti-Semitism. What's the definition of it? So that's, a, that's an important and it's a troubling difference um, because in order to effectively combat anti-Semitism, first of all, there needs to be a consensus on defining it. And the, the people at one end of the spectrum have to be willing to acknowledge when, for example, a Congresswoman like Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib talks about Jews controlling the American government. Um, and at the under, other end of the spectrum, um, people need to uh, recognize the anti-Semitism um, at that end and not try to make excuses and say, well, uh, the, you know, the writers at, at, at the Capitol were really an, Antifa, um, Antifa members disguised as the far right. No, I mean, we saw the Camp Auschwitz t-shirts um, and we heard what Elon Omar said. So when both sides can begin to, um, to acknowledge what anti-Semitism is and that it crosses political lines and it's not, it's not predominantly coming from one side or the other, uh, but it has taken new forms uh, in our era. That, it seems to me, is one of the first and most important steps that, that needs to uh, be taken. Thank you. I, I also, yeah, I think that um, Jewish groups working together is, is critically important. And AZM, um, you know, has 33 member organizations that run the gamut on the political spectrum, but we're working together because we're all Zionists. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope that as we see anti-Semitism spread in the country, that that we all continue to work work together. Because it's you know, reading your book, it's very scary when you see what what leads up to these events. Um, I'm going to turn to the to the Q and A now. Um, we have a number of questions. The um, the first one: Did fewer Jewish refugees on a per capita basis pour into the U.S. than into the U.K. because Roosevelt was even more anti-Semitic than not just Churchill but also Chamberlain? There's an interesting contrast between um, the British response to the Jewish refugee crisis and the American response. Because you know, when we think of Neville Chamberlain, of course, we remember him with contempt for um, his appeasement policies. And when we think of British policies towards the Jews in those days, uh, naturally we focus a lot of our attention on the British white paper of 1939, which almost completely shut off Palestine, Eretz Israel, to Jewish uh, immigrant Jew, Jewish refugees trying to flee from the Nazis. And yet there's a point, an important point um, uh, following Kristallnacht in 1938 in which British policy toward Jewish refugees was much more generous. And what I mean by that is um, the famous kinder transports in which 10,000 uh, German Jewish children were allowed to settle in England in uh, late 1938 or in 1939 uh, was one very important practical way of helping Jews. And less, less well known, but no less important, the British also admitted 14,000 young German Jewish women as nannies and housekeepers. But really, it was a gesture to save lives. Now, let's contrast that with how President Roosevelt responded to Kristallnacht. Well, he was the only um, world leader who actually issued a statement directly criticizing uh, the pogrom which is remarkable when you think about that. But the British and the French, because they were so close to Germany geographically and afraid of the Germans, did not even condemn Kristallnacht. Uh, but Roosevelt's condemnation um, left much to be desired. Remarkably, the condemnation did not mention Hitler or the Nazis or the German government or even the Jews. It was just a general expression of, of um, disappointment and shock that such terrible things could happen. That was a verbal condemnation for what it was worth. But in terms of practical steps, we've discussed Roosevelt's refusal to allow Jews to settle in the Virgin Islands. Um, there was legislation a few months after Kristallnacht in the US Congress to allow 20,000 German Jewish children to come into the US outside the quota system, which President Roosevelt refused to support. And ultimately that bill was buried in subcommittee. 
But ironically, a year later, when British children, British uh, Christian children, needed a, um, needed a haven from German bombings, Roosevelt rushed uh, with, with support from Congress, he rushed through legislation um, to admit several thousand British children who came here temporarily and, um, and were rescued from the Germans that way. So there was that terrible contrast. Um, so it's not to say overall, the British were good to the Jews, but when we speak about the specific, um, that specific time period, that British government, the Chamberlain government, this is not Churchill, um, actually did admit many more Jews after Kristallnacht than the Roosevelt administration. Very interesting. Um, the next question is, do you think that Eleanor knew about her husband's refusal to order Long to fill the quotas and, that as, and that's why she was so active with Brandeis and other Jewish causes after his death? First, it's important to understand that this phenomenon of the unfilled quotas was not something that was only, that we only discovered you know, after the war. It was known at the time. Um, there's actually one letter from President Roosevelt to the governor of New York, Herbert Lehman, in which he refers to the fact that the quotas are not being filled. They, they weren't filled because the Roosevelt administration deliberately added um, layers of bureaucratic, um, uh, bureaucratic obstacles to make it harder for refugees to qualify for US visas. So this was a US policy um, that was Jewish leaders at the time knew about it. Again, we find it in the documents and in, in correspondence. They did not make a public issue out of it for some of the reasons we've already discussed, but Jewish leaders were well aware in the 30s and 40s that the existing quotas were not being filled. The, um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of a specific remark by the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, referring to the unfilled quotas, um, but it's likely she was aware in general of the situation. Now, Eleanor did on a number of occasions speak out um, against the Holocaust. And a number of occasions she did go to President Roosevelt and try to influence him to take a somewhat more uh, humane attitude. I would not say that she made a concerted effort. I wouldn't say that she really stuck her neck out. Um, at the same time, we have to keep in mind that FDR did not like getting uh, advice from the first lady. Um, and he gave her a hard time about her efforts on behalf of African-American civil rights, for example. So he wasn't necessarily going to be very receptive um, to her pleas regarding the Jews. And she was able on two occasions to allow Roosevelt, to, to convince Roosevelt to uh, free up a very small number of uh, visas to allow Jews in. And two very specific narrow occasions, I don't think we have time to discuss them here. They are discussed in my book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. Um, so overall, there's no doubt that Eleanor was more sympathetic, but her efforts were rather limited. Thank you. Um, someone is asking what the role of the failure of the New York Times to cover the Holocaust played in giving Roosevelt cover to ignore the plight of European Jews. Professor Laurel Leff, in her book Buried by the Times, explains in a very persuasive detail how the New York Times as the trendsetter um, in American journalism wielded significant influence, uh, both with the general public and to a certain extent with the White House. Now the Times was not always friendly to Roosevelt for various reasons, but the White House paid close attention to what was published in the New York Times and the rest of the press. And what appeared in the Times often set the tone for what appeared elsewhere. So the Times was in a unique position to potentially influence public opinion or um, potentially to, um, to, to influence the public to urge the president to help um, Jewish refugees, for example. And yet the sad story of the Times and the Holocaust as chronicled in the book Buried by the Times is that the Jewish publishers of the newspaper, the Salzburgers, um, deliberately downplayed news of the Holocaust, um, deliberately obscured the fact that most of the, the most of the the Germans' victims were Jews, and in general tried to keep the story. Um, they buried it in the back pages because they were afraid that anti-Semites would accuse the Times of being a Jewish newspaper. Um, thank you. 
Uh, the next question, it, someone asked, as more information, and I don't, I don't know if you can answer this question, Raphael, but is more information of FDR's statements about and actions affecting Jews have come to light over the years? How is it that a large majority of American Jews still look favorably on FDR? It is not my view um, that the majority of American Jews look favorably on FDR's response to the Holocaust. So let's be, let's be precise here. It may well be that a majority of American Jews look back to the New Deal um, and, uh, you know, and, and other Roosevelt era policies in a positive way. And that's completely understandable. And that also helps us uh, you know, understand why there was such overwhelming Jewish electoral support for FDR at the time. 85 to 90% of American Jews voted for Roosevelt in 36 and 40 and 44. Um, and so they appreciated what the New Deal um, was accomplishing then, and, and in retrospect, many people do today. However, with regard to the question of FDR's abandonment of the Jews, um, my sense from um, from uh, my you know my speaking in the Jewish community, my interactions with with uh, with the community at large, is that the overwhelming majority of American Jews today recognize. Um, what the scholarship documents, not just my scholarship, but first and foremost, the scholarship of, of David Wyman and Henry Feingold and Monty Penkower and so many others, which in a nutshell is that um, President Roosevelt had many opportunities to either interrupt the mass murder or to, um, or to help Jewish refugees in other ways, such as giving them haven in the US, and yet deliberately ignored or obstructed those opportunities. Thank you. Um, I, this is a question I'm not sure that, that you can answer either, but um, if FDR hadn't died, would the U.S. have voted for a Jewish state in 1948? We would, I, I guess, what is your sense, given what you know and what your research has revealed about FDR? Well, one question is what might have happened if FDR was president, but the other question is, would it have mattered? In other words, although we all look back fondly at President Harry Truman's decision to, um, to award um, uh, or to, to recognize the state of Israel. Um, it wasn't Truman's recognition which, which created the state of Israel. Um, it was um, the success of the Israeli army in fighting off you know, five invading Arab armies. And arguably it was Truman's embargo on American weapons to the newborn state of Israel that was the real issue. And certainly that was, the, that was the major issue at the time, although um, although American Jewry was unanimous in appreciation for Truman's recognition of Israel, um, the, the arms embargo was actually a major issue uh, for debate in the, um, in the Jewish community and during the presidential election of, of 1948. It was a hotly debated at the Democratic National Convention that year. Um, and the third party candidate in 48, Henry Wallace, the former vice president, he made the issue of Truman's embargo um, a major part of his campaign. He, he was the pro-Israel candidate um, in 48, and he attracted a lot of Jewish votes as a result. So we can speculate as to whether FDR would have extended that recognition or whether he would have supported the UN partition plan, but the UN partition plan did not create Israel. It, in fact, it was never implemented. And recognition on paper from Roosevelt or Truman, ultimately that didn't stop um, you know, the Arab armies. So it's important to look at the context while, um, while we appreciate very much, of course, when the United States supports Israel in any way, um, it's also important to, to look back at those events and realize that it was the arms embargo, not the question of recognition, that was really a crucial factor that could have um, stopped Israel from coming into being had it not been for the decision of the Soviet Union to allow large amounts of weapons to go from Czechoslovakia to Israel during the 40 year war. Interesting. Um, we're, we're sort of at time. I'm going to end with this last question. Um, it, is the organized Jewish leadership taking the right steps and doing enough today to fight anti-Semitism? Well, as a historian, I think I'll have a better answer to that years from now, when we can look back at the historical context, when we can see the ramifications of different decisions and events, and especially when we can open uh, when, they are, when the relevant archives are open, we can go back and we can look at Jewish leaders and what they're doing today the same way that I and other scholars now look back at 
Stephen Wise's correspondence and, and other documents in order to better understand um, the decisions by Jewish leaders at that time. But to reiterate a point I made earlier, um, in fighting anti-Semitism today, the first thing that, that, that will have to be accomplished in order to effectively uh, combat it is a consensus on what it is. And just to give you one, one small illustration of, of the way there are so many different perspectives, the FBI decides whether something is a hate crime um, based on what is determined to be the motive of the perpetrator. The Anti-Defamation League, however, has a different definition for determining whether a, a particular incident is anti-Semitic. And so, for example, um, all those bomb threats that were made against Jewish institutions back in early 2017, um, which everyone assumed were anti-Semitic and then turned out to be the work of a mentally unbalanced Israeli teenager, but the ADL continued, continues to consider those to be 155 anti-Semitic incidents because from their point of view, the people who received those threats felt terrorized, therefore that figures into their count. Well, if, if we can't even agree on how to count anti-Semitic incidents, then we can't know, is it, are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they staying the same? What factors are shaping them? So again, it will, it will take some time, um, certainly before scholars um, can reach definitive answers on these kinds of questions. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, as I had mentioned at the beginning that this was gonna be a fascinating conversation and uh, I, I believe that it was. You've written a number of books um, that uh, Alicia has listed in the uh, chat section for people that are interested. Um, I'm sure you can also Google them, but, but again, this is uh, Raphael's book and it is well worth the read. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, on behalf of AZM's Anti-Semitism, Anti-Zionism and Holocaust Denial Project, I wanna thank everybody for joining and uh, Dr. Medoff, thank you again. Thanks for having me, take care. Shalom.